Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning to everyone, and welcome to this Columbia Engineering Town Hall for returning students. My name is Matthew Potashnik, and I'm the Associate Dean for Student and Family Support, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. A few housekeeping items before we begin. In the Zoom webinar platform, in which I know all of us are very well versed these days, you will only be able to see and hear from the presenters. Your video, microphone, and chat functions will not be enabled. While we solicited questions in advance, we invite you to ask additional questions during today's webinar using the Q&A submission box on the side of your screen. Given the large number of participants in today's webinar, we will not be able to answer every single question. Though as moderator, I will try to consolidate the most commonly asked questions into topical areas to maximize our time together. All of the questions that you submit today will be used to help us enhance the information on the Columbia Engineering website. During today's webinar, each of our panelists will spend a couple of minutes introducing themselves and sharing a brief update about the functional area they represent. We will leave ample time for questions and discussion. It is important to note that the COVID-19 virus and its global impact is still very much an active and dynamic situation. That which we share today reflects the most current information, university policies, procedures, and public health guidance as of Monday, July 27th. Some of what we share today is likely to change, so continue to monitor your Columbia email and our websites for the latest news and information. We will also be recording this webinar for those students who are unable to join us this evening. I know that each of you is seeking clarity and looking to make meaning from the complex individual and societal challenges posed by the pandemic. It is my hope uh, that today's webinar provides you with helpful information uh, answers many of your questions and offers you a better understanding about the health and wellness preparations, uh, the academic, residential life, and co-curricular experiences that await you in the year ahead. On today's panel, we'll be joined by Dr. Barclay Morrison, Professor of Biomedical Engineering and Vice Dean of Undergraduate Programs, Dr. Melanie Burnitz from Columbia Health, Kavita Sharma, Dean of the Center for Career Education, and Kristen Crum, Dean of Undergraduate Student Life. Also joining us are Leora Brothman, Senior Associate Dean, and Andrew Pla, Dean of Advising. But for now, it's my pleasure to introduce Mary Boyce, Dean of the Fu Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Science. So welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us uh, this evening. It's this evening here, and wherever and whatever time zone you may be in. Um, so thanks for taking the time. We know, you know, how uncertain everything feels for you right now. And I really want you to know how much we've been planning and preparing uh, every dimension of what the, what the coming year will be. Uh, that we know it's a special time in your lives, in, the, in your education, and in your engagement with each other, and your engagement with Columbia. And we've been working to really make this uh, coming fall to be a special experience, whether you're going to be joining us on campus or, or remotely, um, and on into the spring and on into the summer. So there's some also some very nice and special elements this year, which we do hope everyone takes advantage of. So you're going to hear a bit about uh, on the um, details of some of the academics from, um, from uh, Barkley Morrison. You'll hear about our preparations on um, health and safety from Melanie Burnett and from Student Life from Kristen Crum and and also how we're preparing, continuing to prepare you for uh, career education from Kavita Sharma. So let me um, say a few things on, you know, what we've been doing to really prepare for you. Uh, first was the very major announcement from President Bollinger about taking advantage of an expanded calendar. So. Typically, uh, at SEAS, where you're taking courses in fall and spring, anywhere from 15 to 18 units in a given semester. On occasion, some, some very, very few of you uh, love to just totally overdo it and take 21. Let me assure you, you will be able to do that if you so desire. But what we want you to think about um, for this coming year is the fact that we're also going to be offering classes in the summer. And this will be uh, up to a total of 40 credits. So it's letting you spread over the three terms. So 12 units in the fall as a minimum, but you can still take 15, 18 or more, uh, 12 units in the spring, and then, uh, or more if you so desire, 
but then also take advantage of summer. And summer will be special. There's summer A and summer B. So the summer courses will be what we call immersive courses, as they are now, but there, there'll be a wider breadth of courses in the summer. So we want you to take advantage of this uh, great opportunity to, to pace yourself differently, if that's how you want to use the three terms, or to take an extra class or two to explore an area that you have never had been able to fit into the into the intense Columbia schedule uh, before. So we really do hope that you take advantage of the three terms. I also want to say that if you're a senior, if you're a uh, class of 2021, that uh, you know all the course offerings are there for you to, to complete your degree fall and spring if you so desire. That uh, as, you, as you know, you've seen the calendar the calendar for the spring is January 11th through April 26th, and the week after April 26th is when we will have class day and commencement, right? So uh, if you're a senior and you choose to be spreading, spreading your curriculum, you can still take classes in the summer and still participate and be part of class day and commencement in that week in, week in April. So we want you to know you've got that full set of opportunities available to you. So, so I think this is a very special time for you to be thinking a little bit differently about how you pace your curriculum and organize your curriculum. Um, we also, uh, uh, as you know, have some students will be here on campus in the fall, some in the spring, and, and uh, so we will you'll be a combination in person and remote over your, over your time in the coming year. And our, all of our classes, which um, Professor Morrison will talk more on, will have, will have, every class will have remote capability MCs. Um, but you, we've, as I've emailed you in um, the various communications, have lots of opportunity for those on campus for the classes to be in person or what we call hybrid. So you'll hear more about uh, that soon. Um, also, uh, I want to say a few words about financial aid. I said, I said maybe a bit more about this uh, in the morning session with, with your parents, but uh, as you know, Columbia is committed to financial aid for our students. Any student who shows need, uh, we meet that financial aid. So our policy continues and we do know that many families are under greater financial stress uh, given the pandemic and the impact uh, across the country and frankly across the world. And so, so this is a, a situation we're very cognizant of and working closely with the financial aid office to meet family needs. Um, as, as many of you know, the, there are many things done uh, during the move out to aid students and move out. We also provided a wa waiver opportunity for the summer work contribution. And you will see a waiver opportunity for the fall work contribution uh, coming up uh, in the coming, coming weeks. Right. Um, your uh, financial aid letters will also be going out soon. So, so we're definitely paying a lot of attention to make sure that you're comfortable uh, with, with us meeting the, your needs and, um, and understanding the dramatic nature of the situation on, on uh, the financial status of many families um, across the country. The, um, uh, let me also say a bit about the financial aid package because we've seen some questions on this on if you are on campus or remote. Uh, if you are remote, uh, with regard to the room and board option, we do also provide a financial aid package for a, a living stipend if you are remote. Um, and, and on campus, we have the room and board traditional financial aid package. So this is, uh, this is all all out there, um, but I'm just stating it so that you are, are aware since, you know, many things are, are coming your way and, um, and we want to make sure that you're getting all the information you need. Um, I'll answer more questions on, um, on the curriculum, et cetera, uh, if, if you have them after uh, Dean Morrison um, uh, talks and I'm going to hand it over to Barkley now uh, so he can give you some more details on the academics that you'll be um, experiencing coming up. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dean Boyce. Um, so good evening, everybody, or good morning, 
or good afternoon, as Matthew said, wherever you might be um, zooming in. I'm Barclay Morrison. I'm a professor of biomedical engineering. I'm also vice dean of undergraduate programs. And I'd like to just start by acknowledging how stressful the current situation uh, could be in everybody's lives right now, and that we here at the university are prepared to support uh, each and every one of you as you pursue your studies uh, in this com coming academic year. Uh, along those lines, an excellent source of, of advice and information is your individually assigned advising deans and the Barrick Center for Student Advising, led by Andrew Plot, Dean of Advising, who is here with us on the webinar. Uh, your don't forget your departmental major advisor uh, is another excellent source of advice, particularly for those upper level courses uh, for junior, junior and senior year in particular. So as Dean Boyce mentioned, we've really thought deeply about how to accommodate these challenges for the academic year. Courses will primarily be offered according to a hybrid model, what we're calling a high flex model. This model offers full remote learning for those off campus and a hybrid of in-person and remote learning for students on our campus uh, or in the city to manage population density in accordance with New York City and New York State public health guidelines. Our Center for Teaching and Learning has been running instructional activities for our faculty over the summer as they prepare their courses for this new hybrid uh, modality of teaching. CourseWorks has many built-in features that faculty are leveraging for facilitating group interactions, including chat, conferences, discussion boards, a plugin called Piazza, uh, plus simultaneous sharing of documents and reports like you uh, probably already do now. On our campus, classes will accommodate in-person attendance of 50 people or fewer, given the current physical distancing guidelines. According to this model, students attending classes on campus will be with their full course cohorts for enrollments less than 50, while providing online access for those joining remotely. For large enrollment classes, in some cases, the class will be rotating in groups, moving between in-person and remote classes so that everybody has a chance to uh, join in the in-person activities. All of our classes will be able to accommodate students in a fully remote mode. We've installed enhanced classroom technology with video and audio capabilities for remote attendance. These include installation of multiple cameras for different views of the classroom, as well as multiple microphones so that remote students can hear questions and discussions from the in-class students. Remote students will also be able to ask questions through the online bridge. We'll also be offering asynchronous attendance of lectures to accommodate students in different, different time zones or who have other challenges and can't be in the classroom syn synchronously. We'll also be offering office hours and recitation sections for classes so that students can have an opportunity for those in-person engagement with the instructors. Registrar is currently updating the registration system to show the modality of instruction for these courses and students will have the opportunity to update their courses based on that information. Uh, as you know, registration was delayed by a week, should have started today, but the registrar needed time to enhance the capabilities of the system to show this information so that you've got the most up to date and detailed information to make your choices appropriately. Um, I'll let my colleague Melanie Burnett go into some of the health and safety protocols um, but our classrooms and spaces on campus are being adapted so as to follow physical, physical distancing mandates, as well as enhanced air filtration and other requirements uh, that are recommended by CDC and other authorities. So I'd like to turn now um, to talk about teaching laboratories, as well as research opportunities for the upcoming semester and year, because I know these are extremely important um, for your experiences. Lab classes will be offered in person. Um, <clears throat> where possible and in keeping with physical distancing and other public health mandates. We're looking into multiple sections for some lab courses to bring students in, in small groups, so everyone has a hands-on opportunity with the equipment. We're also developing ways to accommodate students in remote model, uh, in remote mode, including the use of experimental kits for some classes that we'll be able to send home, um, either to home or for students to have remotely, even in their dorm rooms, uh, we're vetting the kits, making sure they're safe, uh, making sure that uh, uh, there's no safety issues with what we're sending out. For other courses, uh, instructors are recording laboratory demonstrations for remote and asynchronous viewing. Uh, so uh, the, the off-campus students will, will have a, a better sense of being there in person and live. 
some majors you might be uh, interested in, in year-long capstone senior design components. Uh, the curriculum for most of these uh, aligns very well with seniors being on campus in the spring because the fall semester is really spent learning about the design process. Uh, you don't jump straight into designing uh, a solution. Uh, first, you actually learn about the design process. Identify a real world problem, brainstorm that problem, understanding the surrounding intellectual property space, building a business plan. And then during the spring semester, when you will be on campus, you'll be able to build, test, and iterate on those projects uh, using the teaching laboratories, makerspace, um, and even some of the research labs. Speaking of research labs, a big part of the undergraduate experience here at Columbia, uh, of course, is you're working in our cutting edge facilities and being mentored by our world-class faculty. Uh, remote research, both at the graduate and undergraduate level, has never stopped and will continue throughout the semester for appropriate projects. We'll also be allowing undergraduates to pursue laboratory research on campus if the research ramp up density enables this. We're currently at a 50% density in the research ramp up and this ramp up is both going well and is planned. Columbia formed a special working group on research that has issued planning tools and guidance for how to ramp up our on-campus research over several stages. Our campus research successfully resumed in late June and we've implemented several tactics including training, daily self-checks, face covering, PPE at all times, and physical distancing to maintain the safe laboratory environment. All the principal investigators of the labs developed detailed ramp, uh, ramp up plans for the labs. And this has all gone very well, as I mentioned. And we recently moved into the second stage, which has allowed us to increase occupancy density and which also includes mandated COVID-19 testing uh, before returning to campus. So this time, the expectation is that students will be able to participate in research activity, both remotely as well as on campus this coming academic year. I hope that I've answered many of your questions about teaching and research. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Matthew Patash. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Morrison. We're now gonna to turn to Dr. Melanie Burnitz from Columbia Health to share some updates about our public health and medical preparations. Great, thank you, Matthew. And welcome um, returning students. I'm Melanie Burnitz, Associate Vice President and Medical Director for Columbia Health. And I oversee um, all the health services that are available to you on campus. And so I'm working on the public health preparations for your return. And we are so excited to welcome you back to campus soon. Um, though campus life will be very different in the fall, we're taking every precaution to keep you safe. And as others have mentioned over the past few months, we've been working with our public health experts and infectious disease specialists to prepare for a safe resumption of undergraduate life at Columbia. Um, there are many layers to our public health approach and we rely on every member of our community or students, faculty and staff to work together as we return to prevent spread of COVID-19. So I wanted to highlight a few of these approaches. Um, as you know, there are some really key public health measures that keep us safe now with great scientific data to back up how effective these measures are. So first of all, face coverings. We will all be wearing face coverings pretty much at all times, the few exceptions being obviously when we're eating or drinking, or if we're in our room or our office alone with the door closed. And face coverings stop us from getting sick and they protect others if we are infected with COVID-19, even if we don't know it and if we have no symptoms. So face coverings are gonna be an important part of our return to campus. The second one is physical distancing, six feet or two arms length apart. This physical distancing is true even in the classrooms and the lounges and other areas on campus. That's why dorm rooms on campus are singles this year. That's why there's um, capacity changes in the classroom so we can maintain that six foot of physical distancing. And then add to that hand washing, cough and sneeze etiquette, frequent cleaning of high touch surfaces. These are all really important interventions that stop the spread of COVID-19. So when you come back to campus, you'll see it looks pretty different. There's signage everywhere to really help us support these measures. There's reminders about face coverings, reduced capacity in the elevators, markings on the ground in high traffic areas to remind us to stand six feet apart. Places with tight access like certain corridors or the dining halls may have directional arrows on the floor to keep us moving just in one direction. And our facilities and custodial staff are working to keep campus clean. They're cleaning the high touch areas more frequently. They've been provided adequate personal protective equipment to keep them safe while they're doing their job. So what happens um, on a daily basis? Well, one of the big changes is, is using a new app called Reopen CU. 
those of us who are on campus now are using that every day. And that's an app where every morning we are tested if we're feeling well, um, if we've been in contact with anyone with COVID-19. Um, and we get a green pass that allows us access to campus buildings. But if you're not feeling well, if you've had exposure to someone, you, you enter that into the app, you get a red pass and you get guidance as to what to do. But it really keeps reminding us on a daily basis when to come in and maybe when to stay away. Um, there's always a lot of questions about testing. And I want to say that testing is one prong in a multi-pronged approach here. It's not the only prong, but we've been working with our modelers and statisticians to formulate the testing plan for our undergraduate students. And we know those living in dorm settings are at higher risk of COVID-19 transmission than maybe other groups. Um, and we know that our students living off campus mix with these students. So we have the same testing plan for all our undergraduate students who are coming back to campus, whether you're living on campus or off. Um, we're gonna test every undergraduate at the beginning of the semester. So those of you living on campus, you will get a COVID-19 PCR test on the day you move into your residence hall. And similarly, for those living off campus, we will test you before you return to campus. We will then test this entire group very frequently, particularly at the beginning of the, the semester. And the frequency of the testing may change depending on the situation that we're seeing in New York City and the situation on campus. Um, so we're, we're continuing to work with this uh, public health experts, infectious disease specialists and the modelers to make sure that we can really adapt and flex our testing model to give um, the best testing program to you all. We're setting up a dedicated testing center on campus that will be easy for you to access to come in quickly, get a super quick nasal test and then get your results really quickly and be reassured of two things. Firstly, your results are confidential. We only share information as required by law. And secondly, there's no cost to students for this testing. It doesn't matter what your insurance coverage is, we're not billing this to insurance. So all students have access at no cost to this surveillance testing. Similarly, if you should become unwell and have symptoms of COVID-19 through Columbia Health, we can test you um, as well there. And to add to that, we also have our own team of contact tracers. So if someone does test positive, uh, we'll rapidly find out who they were in contact with and assess their exposure and provide adequate guidance. Um, if someone does become ill with COVID-19, we have identified a dorm, a McBain Hall, that will solely be used for students who live in our dorms and are then diagnosed with COVID-19. And within that space, we'll support students fully, including providing meals, regardless of meal plan, daily medical support, um, through our counseling service, daily virtual support spaces, as well as individual counseling as needed. And if a student off campus gets diagnosed, we're going to provide you advice on how to isolate. Usually you can isolate in your regular space and provide you the same level of medical and psychological support that I just described. Um, Quarantine is another big area of concern, I'm sure, as you're all coming from all around the country and all around the globe. So we've got extensive plans to support students who need to quarantine. Right now, as you're aware, New York State has a travel advisory and that's being updated daily. So you should continue to check that. And similarly, the CDC recommends a quarantine for anyone coming from overseas. Um, so we're working with the state on guidance as to whether or not testing has any impact on the quarantine requirements, but likely it does not. So right now, the quarantine requirements, um, if you're coming from a state on New York State's travel advisory list or from overseas, is that you're expected to quarantine for 14 days before you can really um, put fully participate in campus activities. So there's a couple of ways you can accomplish this. The first would be if you're able to arrive in New York State or in a state that is not on the travel advisory list, 14 days before you move on to campus. So you're quarantining in another location. If you're able to do that, you can participate in campus activities immediately upon your move into campus. But I know this may not be possible for many of you. So if you're unable to, you can quarantine on campus or in, in, on your residence um, off campus. Um, and usually that can be done in your regular space and we'll provide you with guidance as to what to do. Similarly, if you're exposed to COVID-19 during the semester, we'll provide you guidance on how to quarantine around medical support, psychological support, food and academic support. And regardless, um, Columbia Health is here to support your well-being throughout the term, whether you're living on campus or off campus, or even if you're studying remotely, we're still here to support you. Our staff on site have extensive offerings for medical care, counseling, workshops, programs, and assistance with accommodation. And we also have numerous virtual support, including telehealth, telemental health, um, and, and lots of workshops. So regardless of where you're studying, we're here to support you uh, as you return to campus. So we really look forward to welcoming you back. I'll pass it back. 
Thank you, Dr. Bernitz. We're now gonna turn our attention to Dean Sharma from the Center for Career Education for some updates uh, about the work that um, the team in CCE is doing to help prepare for your um, co-curricular internship and job experiences. Good evening, students. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I wanna provide you with just some brief updates on what you can expect during the fall semester from the team at the Center for Career Education. You can expect a robust program, um, a full program from CCE, which will be all available virtually. And that's to make sure that we're equally able to support you if you're on campus as well as off campus. I also want to add that many of the employers that we work with um, are not themselves able to travel to campus. So there's no sense that if you're not on campus, you'll be missing out on any face-to-face -face opportunities to meet with and network with employers. Um, it is a brave new world that they're in, just as much as us, um, and we're making sure that our virtual programming will support you, whether you're on campus or off. You, you can also expect, though we're in recession, a full recruiting program from CCE, which will feature internships and full-time jobs. I'm happy to report that we're busy planning virtual career fairs for you. That includes the undergraduate career fair, which will be coming up in September. Um, as well as the engineering career fair. And what we're gonna do is split those two career fairs so that they take place over two days. Um, and there won't be any lines in learner, which I think is definitely a bonus. I hope you'll all agree. Um, we've got some new offerings that we've been busy putting together over the summer. Um, a series called Networking From Home that some of you may have already participated in. This features Columbia alumni um, who want to meet you and want to talk to you and want to help to support you during this difficult time. And those are all themed around industry, as well as micro career fairs, which will be recruiting opportunities, again, themed around industry. Those of you who've been in touch with us over the summer will know that our practice interview nights um, have continued. Um, again, featuring Columbia alumni supporting you by practicing interview skills with you, all virtually, because that is the new uh, recruiting landscape that we're in. And we'll be starting those programs again in August. I wanna give a particular plug to our team of career counselors. Um, many of you will have already done remote virtual interviews. Maybe some of you have already done virtual internships this summer, but it is slightly different um, doing everything virtually. So I want to encourage all of you, if you're not already, to make sure you're connected with one of our career counselors. All of our career counseling services will be available over Zoom. You can sign up for an appointment on Lionshare. There will be virtual quick questions. We're adding a slot in the morning um, for international students. That's, that's new. And then we'll be two to four with quick questions in the afternoon as well. Again, all virtually, all remote. And I'm gonna give an extra second plug now to the Career Counseling Service because having a connection one-on-one -on -one with somebody on the staff who can help you navigate as things change and as things evolve and as we will continue to deal with certainty, uncertainty, sorry, um, is going to be extremely important. Finally, those of you who have Lionshare profiles, please make sure that you update them. Um, make sure you fill in your industry preferences. We've created a whole set of new series of industry themed newsletters where we're sending you live updates from employers that we're talking to. So please in, um, indicate your industry preferences to receive those newsletters. And insofar as I'm able to share silver linings, this is a, a difficult moment for all of us for sure. But one of the things that we found at CCE through the summer is employers have been really responsive. Um, they're now working from their sofas, they're working from around the globe, um, and they're now able to connect with us in a much more seamless way than those campus visits would otherwise have required. There's no need for a transportation budget, there's no need to dispatch five people to a career fair. Um, now employers are doing everything from their sofas. So what we found is that we've been able to build connections with new employers across the globe and nationally as well. So stay engaged, uh, be connected to us, um, do read all the newsletters um, and make sure that your lion's share profiles are up to date. And that's the best way of um, staying in touch and, and keeping informed with what's going on. And to echo what everyone else has already said, we're really looking forward to getting back to working with you closely um, and moving things forward. So I'll turn it back to you, Matthew. Thank you so much. 
And finally, we're going to hear from Dean Crum from Undergraduate Student Life. So you can give us an overview of the on-campus preparations and residence halls, student groups, clubs, housing, dining, um, all the things that are in place to welcome you physically back to campus. Or for those of you that are unable to be here on campus, how we can work with you to stay engaged. Thank you. Um, so my role in undergraduate student life, I oversee multicultural affairs, student engagement and residential life. Um, but I do work very closely with partners throughout the university. So have some updates on housing, dining, health and university event management. Um, and so hopefully can provide a broad snapshot of student life, at least the details that we know at this point. Um, to put your a picture together outside of the classroom for daily life on campus this fall. Um, please note we are still waiting guidance from the university on a number of student life issues. So I'll let you know in which areas we're still waiting for more information. I do know for me in my role living on campus, there's only about 60 students on campus right now. And so it's very exciting to think about more students back. And, you know, although I, I'll see uh, eye expressions, I won't see as many smiles in person, but I really can't wait for some of the in-person interaction. For those of you who are living on campus this fall, um, or who have received an exception to stay with us for the entire year, housing assignments and move-in times will be um, on or before August 7th. They're really putting August 7th out there as the, the date by which you absolutely will know. And then know it's really important to then schedule, once you have your time, schedule your COVID test around your move in assigned time because you cannot check into your residence hall until you have your test. In the halls, um, hopefully we have sent this information out. We didn't want to surprise anyone. Hopefully you've already read that you're only going to be able to swipe into the building in which you're assigned, which we recognize is a really big shift for students at Columbia. And you just, you can't sign anyone in, even another Columbia student, into your own building. Um, it's also going to be that way in brownstones, even though there aren't public safety officers at the guards. And it's really important that folks who are living in the brownstones and might have a little bit more freedom otherwise understand that because we will not keep brownstones open if students aren't able to follow the, the rules of all residence halls in that place. Um, within the halls, our plan is to have residence hall lounges open, again, with adjusted capacities. And so as long as students are using those spaces informally, a gathering space for a few students on the hall with a maximum capacity, as long as face coverings are on and social distancing, physical distancing is there, we'll be able to keep those open. Again, we're trying to opt in um, permissible and things are possible, but if behavior suggests that we need to change course, then we will have to do so. Um, we aren't going to be able to allow for events to happen in the brownstones this fall, and I think it's important that students know that um, coming back. Everyone returning to campus will need, so students, faculty, and staff living on campus or off campus needs to agree to the Columbia Health Community Compact, which is essentially that a set of agreements that will wear the face coverings, will agree to physical distancing, and other recommendations to keep the community safe. Folks who aren't able to agree to these and sort of live these agreements won't be able to stay here. And I'll just emphasize, right, there's a really big difference if you live in a corridor style building and you need to use the restroom and you've forgotten to put on your mask to deliberately inviting someone into a space where you know they shouldn't be, right? And so in our educational approach and in our idea that you know, someone who forgets inadvertently needs an educational reminder or a conversation is very different to someone who thinks that it's appropriate during a national pandemic to host a large unsafe gathering. We won't tolerate that and students who aren't able to tolerate that 
won't continue to live on campus or to access the community if you're in the neighborhood. Um, dining, whether you're on campus or off campus, you can sign up for a meal plan. At the start of the semester, everything will be grab and go, although there may be some in-person options as the semester progresses. New York City just moved into phase four last week, um, but we're awaiting guidance from the university task force about the other aspects of student life on campus. We did hear last week that the libraries will be open in some reduced capacity, and those details are forthcoming. Um, at this time still, New York State is prohibiting fitness centers or the gym from opening. So until New York State clears them, Dodge remains closed. Um, I imagine that many on the call tonight are interested in club and organization activities as student leaders, and we're still awaiting guidance in terms of learner and what those hours or capacities will be. It is abundantly clear that as spaces open, there will be reduced capacities, physical distancing, and face coverings as part of our everyday life. Um, and as soon as we have the information, we'll share with you all what is possible, um, both inside and outside. As you know, we prioritize new students and sophomores in the fall with some students across all class years for the full year. But to ensure that all students, all new students, new Colombians to our community have access to orientation in the same way, we are planning for a virtual orientation and our beloved activities day will also be virtual this year. And so we're going to encourage the same thing for student groups that we work with. And as it makes sense and we learn about what's permissible, we'll determine what makes sense to be offered in person. We do imagine lots of things will happen informally and outside as we start the semester. Um, and then for those of you tonight on this call who are involved sophomores, juniors, and seniors in leadership roles, regardless of whether you'll be on campus, in the neighborhood, around the world, we truly need you more than ever to connect with and share your experiences with our newest Colombians. So I look forward to continuing to find ways together to work together and to welcome our new students. And I'll turn it back to Matthew to open it up. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. We've gotten lots of questions uh, on our uh, Q&A box. We also received questions in advance. And so I'm actually going to um, turn back to Dean Crum for a minute. We're getting some questions about how will move-in work. And I know lots of students are trying to make arrangements, plan for flights, arrange with parents, families, or, or friends to travel to New York. Can you give us a snapshot of, of what move-in will look like? What can students expect in terms of um, will parents or family members be allowed in the residence halls? What, what can that experience look like? What should people plan to bring? Um, just a, a quick snapshot of what move-in will look like. A snapshot with a lot of detail. So the sort of broad overview, our move-in days and times will run from Monday, August 31st to Friday, September 4th from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Health will open at 7 a.m. each of those days to begin the COVID testing. Um, it is, again, I mentioned it earlier, but I will again emphasize, you must have your COVID test before you will get a key to get into a residence hall. So that has to happen. Um, we are scheduling it to ensure the reduced density on campus. So it's about 700 students a day across a number of buildings. So. Uh, in the past, there's been a lot of flexibility, students kind of showing up 24 hours a day, whenever you want. We really, we aren't able to accommodate this. Columbia Health is not open all night. We do not have COVID testing in the middle of the night. So really work within the times that we have. Um, as you have information, if there's truly a conflict, try to work it out before you would even consider emailing housing. Um, our housing website, it does say to bring what you can carry in a suitcase and a backpack. And I know from being here all these years that you have a lot more than that. Um, and, you know, while I anticipate that it would be difficult to pack everything you need in a suitcase and backpack. 
to the extent that that is possible, maybe an extra bundle underneath, you should, you should really pay attention to packing in a minimalist kind of way. Um, and then you can, at this time, if your family member or guest is not from a hotspot state or hasn't traveled internationally, then you may be able to have a guest or family member come into a building with you only the building to which you are assigned. Um, you know, unfortunately, that's another one. We're following New York State guidance at the time and at this time. And so if move in were tomorrow, we would say that unfortunately, we cannot welcome those guests from hotspot states into buildings on campus or to our community. Um, I think that gives the general broad overview. Dr. Burnitz, we're getting some questions about um, understanding or explaining the difference between um, quarantining and isolation. And I was wondering if you could just maybe provide a snapshot of what that means. Sure, and sorry for not um, explaining that properly up front. So quarantine is when you separate a group of uh, people from the rest of the population because they may have been exposed, but they're not sick. So quarantine is really for the, is used where you're coming from a hotspot state, but you're not sick coming from overseas, or if you get exposed to someone with COVID-19 and, you, and, and you're not sick. So that's quarantine. Isolation is the separation of sick individuals from the rest of the population. So you quarantine if you've been exposed and you're not sick, you isolate if you've been diagnosed and you are sick. So that's the difference as well between the spaces that I spoke about. McBain is used for isolation. So only people who are tested positive for COVID-19 will be put in an isolation space where it's really, really important that they don't have contact with people who aren't sick um, to prevent transmission. But quarantine often happens in your own space, which is watching you for the 14 days to see if you do develop symptoms, then you would move to isolation. Thank you. Uh, Dean Morrison, we, we have some questions coming in about uh, the classroom experience, whether students are actually physically in a classroom or not. Could you walk us through um, the new classroom experience for students who are in person, what will the classroom look like? And for students who are participating in one of the high flex or fully virtual experiences, how has classroom technology been adapted to ensure that everyone has the chance to be fully participatory? Sure, sure. Um, for on-campus students, um, the classroom's going to look the same as a classroom, um, you're just going to have a lot more space in the classroom. So we'll be, um, you know, observing the social physical distance rules, um, which is again why uh, classes um, up to 50 uh, person enrollments, um, if they're above 50 person enrollments, um, either they will only be online or they will meet in a rotation fashion. Again, um, that's just the largest classrooms that we have on campus, taking into account the distancing rules uh, results in class, uh, class attendance of 50 students or less. Um, in terms of the technology, we've, um, um, CUIT has been uh, working feverishly, no pun intended, over the summer to put <laughs> as many cameras uh, into as many uh, additional classrooms as possible. These include multiple, uh, multiple cameras, so there's multiple views of the class environment so that people who are remote um, have a more inclusive feeling of being in the classroom um, live. So there's wide shots, there's shots of, um, of the other students in the classroom, uh, shots of um, the, the whiteboard, um, views of the podium, and the instructor will be able to <coughs> control these um, and, and change uh, the view as appropriate. Uh, the other thing um, is that we've got, we're installing additional microphones. So this way the uh, online students can hear the questions coming from the class. They can hear the back and forth discussion with the instructor and the students in the class. So that um, really it'll be as if the students are, are in the classroom. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the faculty, um, or TAs uh, who are in the class to help them will be able to monitor the, the Q&A uh, as well as the chat so that um, as questions come in uh, online, um, the faculty will be able to answer them in real time as well. So a lot of technology making it really seamless uh, for being in the classroom or being online. 
and maybe sticking with Dean Morrison and or Dean Plough for a minute, you know, and one of the hallmarks of the Columbia engineering experience is lots of interaction with faculty members. Uh, what can students expect in terms of office hours and access to um, other advisors on campus? Sure, one of, one of the strategies that we've been partnering with the registrar on is um, getting spaces, larger spaces for office hours. So rather than uh, in order, rather than showing up at a, at a faculty's office, which might be rather small and, you know, under the best of times holds maybe 10 people, um, we have partnered with the registrar to make requests for the larger rooms so that faculty can hold larger office hours while maintaining the physical distance so that students do get that in-person interaction uh, with the faculty, um, whether it's in person, but then also the same um, in those registrar controlled spaces will be the technology so that even if a student is online off campus, um, they'll still feel like they're in the room with the rest of the class. So I know in Columbia Engineering, there's a large number of international students. And Dean Boyce, I was wondering maybe if you could um, give us an update about the support for international students and, and the encouragement that international students also seek support through ISSO is, is gonna be an important part of the message. So, so if you're an international student, we do strongly encourage you to be um, following our ISSO and, and be when ISSO sends an email, we're absolutely extremely closely watching um, all the developments around international students. We do encourage you to be um, on campus or in the New York area for, for taking your classes, uh, given the, the dynamic nature of, of how the um, federal policies have been, have been changing, changing back and changing. So, so we're definitely here to support you uh, to be able to complete your degree requirements and have the full experience as a Columbia student. Great. Uh, I know that there was a big reaction on the in the Q and A box about Dodge not being open in the, in the fall semester, and I know there's some questions about phys ed classes and requirements. Um, do we have any sense, Dean Morrison or Dean Plaw, of what students can expect in terms of physical education classes? I know that the uh, phys ed, physical education department is working on plans about how to mount their classes. Some of their classes are already um, ones that would be held outside anyway. So outside venues are still safe venues. Um, I imagine they will also be working with an expansion of other classes that like self-paced running, which students could do on their own outside and then um, keep monitoring their activity and send in the results of their activity uh, to the physical education department. But I'm, I'm, we're still waiting for further details about how each class will be run. And I think that will also be tied to changes in New York state regulations if they actually happen. I don't know if Melanie has anything further to add, but if she does, this is a good time. <laughs> no, no, other than we are required to follow the state guidance around use of gyms, but the, I do know that there are a number of even non-physical um, offerings through PE around wellness and mindfulness and other classes that actually can be taken remotely um, so that there will be opportunities even for students who are not on campus to complete their PE requirements. Okay. So Dean Sharma, I know over the summer, lots of engineering students take advantage of internships and other experiences. Uh, I know this was a summer of disrupted experiences as well. And so I was wondering if you could uh, walk us through what are some ideas or thoughts students can do to take advantage of uh, sort of this new way of working and, and the experiences both um, uh, on campus or, or in the city and in companies or, or research um, to take advantage of what may be a missed summer. No, I'm happy to, to take that question. It's, it's a very important question because we know how important internship experiences are to all of you. Um, I mentioned on the call with parents this morning that without disclosing my age, this is now the third recession that I've experienced <laughs> while at CCE. I was here after 9-11 in 2009 and, and now again. Um, and something that I've noticed already that is slightly different is the responsiveness of employers to this global pandemic. Typically, interns are the first to go, um, and that wasn't always the case um, this past summer. I know many students did have opportunities canceled, but equally many employers were flexible and they were able to pivot to provide virtual opportunities. So we're very much holding on to um, employers um, and new employers who really want to hire students to give them those what might be might well be in the fall continued virtual experiences. 
Um, I think the other thing to say at this time is one of the things that we really want students to do is be kind to themselves. Um, we know that you're all ambitious. Um, we know that you want opportunities. We know you want to build your full portfolio of skills. Um, but this is also a moment where you're going to need to, to be flexible and think about what is available and how we can help and how we can support you. So this actually is an excellent time to do what's an integral part of career education, and that's building relationships, right? So building relationships with faculty, with advisors, access that way to information and knowledge, being engaged through um, the reading of newsletters and taking in of information, and attending activities and events. And across um, the engineering school, whether they're being run by the Engineering Alumni Relations Office, the Center for Career Education, the Center for Student Advising, there will be many opportunities to still be connected to alumni, obviously through CCE, uh, to employers. And it's going to be an evolving situation. Um, but those who will come out with more skills um, and access to opportunities will be those who get engaged. Um, so that would be my big message. This is a great time and a great opportunity um, to build relationships, um, to broaden your own horizons around industries and opportunities and what's out there because it may well be that this academic year um, you don't get exactly what you're looking for so in being flexible you will still be able to navigate your career acquire new skills um, and acquire new information and knowledge and especially contacts and connections so clubs groups um, cce there, there will still be a lot going on um, because it's very important, obviously, for us to support you in this way. Thank you. Dean Crum, there's some questions and concerns about just the, the social nature of campus and how things will look different. What are some ideas or thoughts um, you and your team are working on um, to help students stay connected and involved to clubs or groups or just campus life, whether they're on campus or whether they're thousands of miles away, perhaps at, at home or, or with family? You know, we're exploring all kinds of ideas and it was, you know, somewhat heartening to talk with, right? Because we've actually expanded even orientation this year. So instead of waiting until NSOP week, there's actually a full eight week countdown and it's countdown to Columbia and it's thematic. But so last week I worked with uh, five student leaders um, to offer advice and ideas and, you know, one of the things that I really heard from upper class students was, you know, that sort of initial campus exit in March was was really hard. And by mid-April, people are kind of done with Zoom. But it, it seems that there is a real interest and expressed desire to kind of change it. So groups that we're thinking about, um, you know, we can't have something if we're an acapella group or a performance group, we can't do something virtually where suddenly there's been sort of time to wrap sort of our collective heads around the idea that this wasn't just a, a six week move, that this is at, at least the fall semester and then we'll kind of see how things progress, what's possible. Um, so again, I would say a hallmark of the way that our office works effectively to serve the student body is to work with you. So I've really appreciated the ideas that we have already had um, and look forward to continued ideas. But I know Dean Boyce reminded me earlier about the engineering and the design challenges that have continued to happen over the course of the summer, but we'll continue. You have a great idea. We are happy to help you accomplish it, or we're happy to try to find a way to work in partnership to make it happen. We all need to think together through this. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I know one of the you know, most interesting parts of the Columbia Engineering physical space is the uh, maker space. And I know we're getting some questions about how can students utilize that space uh, this year. Dean Morrison, uh, what's the status of the maker space and what can we expect in terms of access this year? Sure, sure. Um, depending upon the guidelines from New York State. Um, our plan is to have the makerspace open. Um, Art of Engineering uh, will get to use that space for their common project. Uh, it will be open for um, other student groups to use. The caveat is that it needs to be used at a reduced density. And so um, we've been looking at 
reconfiguring the space, uh, spreading uh, machines uh, further apart, um, but and as well as increasing the hours of the space so that um, while abiding by the density requirements from New York State um, and the other health, uh, public health requirements, um, the plan is that those facilities will be open for students to use, uh, not only for classes, but also for uh, their student groups. Um, again, as uh, Dean Crom mentioned, uh, and uh, Dr. Bernitz mentioned, this is of course all uh, abiding by all of the, the health compact and being safe on campus and in all of these spaces. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Bernitz, I know we've talked a lot about uh, public health and COVID, but Columbia Health supports students in, in lots of different areas. Um, for students who are looking for just general regular medical care, uh, support through CPS or the other services in Columbia Health, what's open, what's available uh, in the upcoming academic year? That's a great question. Um, so we are open and available. Uh, medical services are stayed open throughout. We have a, a team on site and will remain open. So I know a lot of people have had a hard time getting their routine care, vaccinations, um, you know, checkups. That absolutely can be done on site and as well through um, telehealth where we're able to manage it. Similarly, CPS will have a team on site as well as continuing to offer the telemental health. Um, so we will continue to support you outside of your COVID-19 needs um, for your health and well-being and in the same way we have um, before. And also to give you guidance, if you aren't coming back to campus, we're still your primary source for medical care. Sometimes we can help you connect with resources in your local community and provide you with guidance. And sometimes you may be surprised by what we can do through telehealth where we're able to with state licensing requirements um, and, and really save you unnecessary trips or expenses for other medical care. So know that we're on campus, know that our team's still completely engaged and we'll continue to support your health and well-being. Okay, thank you. Um, Dean Morrison, we're getting a, a couple of questions related to, to grading as well in the fall semester. I know spring was a pass-fail um, shift, but um, can you talk about what students can expect in terms of grading and, and how will sort of the, the experience of students be considered in, in the way faculty evaluate student performance this year? Sure. Um, so it will no longer be pass-fail. It will be for grades, for letter grades. Um, faculty, as I said, have been uh, innovating over the summertime to, to ensure that um, uh, the distance learning students are incorporated into the class, that they feel a part of the community um, through uh, either for those distance students through um, office hours, recitation hours. Uh, these will all be made available, um, taking into account time zone differences, um, the engineering faculty are, are well aware that we have uh, students from all around the globe. Um, and so making accommodations for those students to be able to get all of um, the help that, that, they, that they need for a class is, is a, a top priority for the faculty. And they'll be able to make the accommodations that, that the students need regardless where they are in the world. And Dean Boyce, we have time for one final question and I'm gonna direct this one to you. Uh, I think students are curious about uh, how faculty have um, learned to teach in many of these new ways and, and what, have faculty been work what have faculty members been working on over the past few months to prepare um, for these multiple, multimodal ways of instructing students? Um, so thank you. Um, so you should uh, know that uh, the CS faculty have been uh, hard at work all, all summer um, that uh, we have many different working groups um, on around education, uh, working groups around the lab courses, uh, the uh, regular uh, uh, meetings with the department chairs and vice chairs and uh, all looking at how do we best prepare, how do we best be ready for our students and, and, and to provide the experience that you're looking for and that we're looking to give to you. Uh, so there are Center for Teaching and Learning um, workshops as well for faculty to, to really um, uh, understand and know the best practices when doing online and when doing a combination of remote plus in person. Uh, also on this new high flex model of being able to have these um, multiple cameras so there's a really immersive experience for somebody who's remote. 
Uh, and as you also heard um, Professor Morrison talk about the, um, the laboratory experience, uh, whether you're in person, how are we designing those labs to be physically distanced? And if, if you're remote, how do we have kits? How do we have demos? How do we have all the right things for, for you? If there are kits, those would be mailed to students who are, who are remote. So there's many, many different aspects. We're in deep discussions on modalities. Of, so which courses have which modalities? Uh, and this is also um, uh, is continually being updated. So on August 3rd, when you're ready to register, uh, when the registrar is ready for you to register, we think you're ready to register today. <laughs> the registrar will be ready for you to register on August 3rd is the current uh, uh, set date. Um, that the modalities will be more optimally um, uh, set. And, and even the size of classes, uh, there's a more morphability on that because of these different modes. So all of these things that the faculty are intensely uh, engaged in um, and, um, you know, it's inspiring to see the engagement and the questions that I get all the time from them, uh, just to, on, you know, making sure they're really prepared uh, to, to offer you the curriculum that you deserve uh, as a Columbia student. So it's exciting to see, and, and they're ready to have you come back. Not, maybe they're not quite ready yet. They'll be ready in a couple of weeks, <laughs> still preparing. So looking forward to it. Great, thank you. So unfortunately, we are out of time for additional questions, but I appreciate that each of you took the time to join us today uh, to share your questions and your comments. Be sure to visit the Columbia University NC's websites for updated information. I want to thank each of our panelists for being here today. I know each of us look forward to talking with you in the days and weeks ahead. Um, but for now, I wish you good health and best wishes for a safe summer. Thank you so much. Thank you.